All right, gonna go with a new person straight out of the Daily Wire as well. This one's Candace Owens, and I think this was actually released today. Well, the day I'm recording it, who knows when this comes out. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Is it me, or are a lot of men acting and looking like sissies these days? I'm being serious. I don't know if it's just because I'm pregnant with a boy, and I do tend to be a little more aggressive, but I feel like I could beat up a lot of men today. Maybe. Who knows? Um, there's not really a lot of ways of testing that. She's also currently pregnant. I'm not sure there's a lot of people who would actually find a pregnant woman. But um, just as a note, um, this is the same network who constantly is arguing against trans folks in sports because... Even the worst of men, they will claim, can win against the best of women, biologically speaking. So, this is a little bizarre. She's literally doing this just to poke button, poke at people. And I look around. Plus, later on in the show, it has been exactly one year since I put on the White Lives Matter shirt with Kanye West at Paris Fashion Show. So we are going to put that on Rewind and reflect. What did I learn from all of that? All that and more today coming up on Candace Owens. The production value is definitely better than mine, right? <laughs> with one computer. Man, I wish I had these kinds of interests. All right, let's start with the facts. There have been significant reductions in testosterone levels observed over time. In one study conducted in 2007, they observed that testosterone decreased by about 22%. 22% 2007. Here we go. Let's see. So this is 2007. It is a report, one report. It is certainly talking about men aged 45 to 79. From 1987 to 1999. Couple of follow-ups. That's good. Specifically in Boston. It's not a wide net, but just one location. 489 men. Oh, no, even more than that. Okay. Oh, uh, these are the updates. Gotcha. Okay, so right now they're talking about overall age of the population, diabetes. There's 20%. All right, so it looks like this article or this study is saying that it's mostly due to increased obesity or BMI concerns. Uh, so there's a decline in exercise and physical activity, uh, environmental toxins, marijuana use. So there's quite a few options here. It's not just because people are sissy, which would be her argument, I suspect. All right, let's continue. Bent, when comparing 1985 levels to those from 2002, that is significant, 22%. In another study that was conducted in 2021, Researchers found a roughly 25 degree decrease in testosterone levels between 1999 and 2016. That is a tremendous decrease in testosterone levels. So there can be no doubt that your grandfather and his father had higher testosterone levels than you. Now, what does that mean, though? So is there a concern here? Is there are higher levels of cancer or are there other issues going on? What is her point? Because somebody could have, you know, lower levels of all sorts of things, iron for that matter. But if it doesn't hit a certain point, it's not really a problem. Um, and there's a, you know, actual designated tract effect. So I'm wondering what her concern is on this. If it's not just to basically attempt to bolster her own demographic or the people watching her show versus trying to point at people and go, oh, your testosterone levels are low. Um, when obesity seems to be striking, like both political parties. Anyways. Assuming that you are a male living in today's society. So why is that? I don't know why. I won't be able to answer that. The studies that she's probably reading would answer that question for her just like it took me only about five to ten minutes to find a lot of folks who are finding connections between various aspects and why this is a de decrease 
The first one, to be fair, was just about Boston, Massachusetts. The second one, I think I pulled up. Um, let's see. Fallen and Young Men. This one's 2020. Yeah, this was the Lokshwar. I can't say this name. Sorry. Um, this is the one that the conversation was about elevated body mass index was significantly and independent associated with decreased TT levels. So that would be BMI, body fat percentage, um, decreased physical activity. All of those things may have had, may have been the impact. That's what this, this doctor is concluding. Like this didn't take that long to find it all. So again, this is going through a, process that maybe the Daily Wire doesn't do any research. I shouldn't say they don't do any research. I should say they they do research and then uh, choose a story and then stop caring. All right. Last one was really long, so I want to kind of get through this one. So we're going to do a little bit more quick pace. A lot of people have their own theories. Some people think it's the food. Some people think uh, it's it, the things that are being sprayed on the crops. Other people have other theories. But what I will say is that that never became more clear to me than when I was watching a documentary, which I really recommend every person watches. It was on Netflix, but it was amazing. It was called World War II in Color, and they essentially went back and they had... Okay, I don't even understand this point, so I'm just gonna let her finish. Had all the footage from World War II and just colorized it as they told the story. And they did a very good job. It was apolitical, so apolitical, in fact, that as I was watching this documentary, and I never cry, but I was really boohoo crying watching this, because suddenly you could really see the faces of those individuals, those soldiers, and you cried for the German soldiers, you cried for the American soldiers, you, you cried for the Japanese. World War II? Okay, so I guess you're crying for Nazis. I guess you're just saying you're crying for any soldier who's dying in war. I could see that. I I'm, I can back that. That's a fine concept, right? We shouldn't have war. Uh, we should be beyond that. And people dying in it is a terrible thing. I agree fully. And we don't take care of uh, folks when they get back. I agree with all of that. These soldiers, because it became apparent how young they were. You know, you're talking about mm -hmm. men that were 18 years old, knowing that they were going to die for their country. When I say Some knowing, I'm talking about younger, Japanese right? young men that were going on suicide missions. You imagine that. You are going out and you know that today is going to be the day that you die. It's incomprehensible. And then they told the story of the Battle of Midway and they honed in on these uh, pilots who were going out and they were flying, knowing that they did not have enough fuel to get them back. So you imagine these young American pilots, 18, 19, 20, knowing that they did not have enough fuel to get back. Again, incomprehensible to imagine the bravery that these young men had. Is she going to tie in, is she going to somehow say that testosterone is related to bravery or that our current military force is worse than our World War II military force? Because not only are we more technologically advanced, advanced you know, have a better technology than we did at the time, but we also have just fantastic soldiers and training. And I mean, I don't know if you've seen special forces folks, but they're amazing people and regular military folks too. And world war two, we, we didn't really know what we were doing in training soldiers. And I'm glad that there are people who volunteered, but I'm, I'm just curious. What's she going to say? And then you think about the, the women who were sending their sons. I can't imagine sending my son at the age of 18, knowing for certain that he's going to die, right? Women were stronger back then. Men were stronger back then, and they looked it. So look at the photos of those 18-year-olds who served in World War II. They look like men, right? You can see their boys. Wait, wait, so she's claiming that men were stronger back then and women were stronger back then. Is she also going to indicate that women's testosterone levels were higher? I wonder if that's the case. Women's testosterone levels over the past.
19th century. It's possible. Oh, this is interesting. This section has the numbers. Basically true until the 70s, until the early 80s. 534 versus 580. That doesn't really show the same like 25% decrease that she was talking about, but we'll ignore math and the daily wire for precision. Oh, these are interesting. North America is still better than like East Asia. The, I don't know what the West would be, Latin America, Eastern Europe. Just below Siberia, Sub-Saharan Africa. I wonder if this, I wonder if they were able to draw conclusions from this. Chemicals are adding to that as a list. Interesting. This article says both 2007 and 2021 didn't Anyone on the Daily Wire would have read USA Today. And these have those exact numbers. So at least it's the exact same studies. And none of them studied anyone over the last two decades. Hmm. This one also says we should be worried about obesity, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes combined with sedentary lifestyle, all of which can contribute to testosterone deficiency. Okay, fine. So there's a little bit to the, like, hey, there's... Maybe not a clear answer, but most of them are indicating that all the things that we already know about the more wealthy societies in the world um, gain weight, become less active, and uh, have a lot more chemicals, more instances of diabetes, and a lot of other things that might reduce testosterone levels. Boyish features in their boyish eyes, but they, they look bigger than the 18-year-olds that we are producing today. Which brings me to something that I do every year, multiple times a year. I visit college campuses, and I just want to give myself a pat on the back for being able to stand there and to do it right now, especially I am eight months pregnant, having to sit into this room and to deal with people, not people who are going out knowing if they don't have enough fuel to get home, going out knowing if they're going to die for their country, but people that think it's an act of bravery to have to listen to a conservative speak. Oh my God, I feel so sad for these people. How am I gonna be able to sit here and listen to a conservative speak? It always makes me angry, actually, when I see the individuals, the adults, the young adults that we are producing today, because I think about that. I think about the past, which is so recent, really, in our American history, our very- Well, so I don't think these things are related. Um, it's not gonna be that you have higher testosterone level and then that makes you more accepting. We had a lot of anti-Semites, racists, all kinds of people in the early 1900s. That's pretty clear from the absolute horrific laws we had during the time. Um, I do agree with the idea that, hey, you're on a college campus. If there's a place for dissenting opinion, even ridiculously ludicrous ones, right? Those people should be allowed to speak. Um, I think most people should be allowed to speak freely and we can hear their ideas, we can counter argue uh, against them. As long as someone's not committing actual physical, economic kind of violence uh, towards another person, then yeah, I would say they, they should be allowed to pretty much speak. We may not like it, there may be consequences for them, uh, they may not get a lot of YouTube hits or views or whatever the case may be, but we should be able to stand up and listen to people on the other side. We also don't have to be there, right? That's the other part of it. So unless if you're required to listen to somebody, that's different than if they're just a person speaking on a campus. Yeah. So I don't know if that would make me angry in her position. She's like, what, a multimillionaire? Uh, like many of the people in the Daily Wire and a lot of influencers, I'm not too concerned with whether or not she's... Like, if everyone was just okay with her talking in front of these college groups, mostly her career would be ended. Like, she makes her career off of pushing people's buttons, antagonizing them, just like Charlie Kirk, just like Crowder, just like Ben Shapiro... These people don't make their career by and haven't made their career by um, being open and thoughtful and completely reasonable. They need to have some antagonistic nature. 
in order to get the shares and the likes and the videos and things like that, right? I wish I was popular enough and had not as much money as any of these people. And all I had to do was essentially do bad research and yell at folks all day. I'll do a Charlie Kirk debate here soon. And you'll, you'll see what I mean. Very short American history. And then I compare them to these individuals who I speak in front of, and then they get the courage to ask me a question. They stand up and they try to have what they believe is their Martin Luther King moment. They're going to say something strong and assertive to Candace Owens. It's going to be, I have a dream speech. It happens over and over again. Well, yesterday I visited a campus up in Albany, New York, and as was to be expected, I had a very short fuse with these children because I'm not here to raise you. I don't know why you turned out this way. I don't know why you think that it's an act of bravery to ask a conservative a question or to insult a conservative. Um, but I was required to answer these individuals for about 30 minutes, and it was just incredible how many people to raise you. I don't know why you turned out this way. I don't know why you think that it's an act of bravery to ask a conservative a question or to insult a conservative. Um, but I was required to answer. Required? Who's requiring her to speak in front of college students? She goes there knowing this is going to happen. She goes there speaking in front of people. My question would be, obviously, this is, but so who's requiring this? Is this required because of your contract that you have to like stand up and take abuse from people or what you consider a uh, verbal abuse? Um, what kind of network is it that would require you to do that? Interesting choice of words these individuals for about 30 minutes and it was just incredible how many people from the queer community had something to say to me take this young woman as an example take a listen she said that like she's never heard the word queer trans students on this campus who actively feel victimized by your presence here today additionally you just pointed out that this man detransitioned but earlier in your speech you guys i want to hear her go ahead what do I have to say? Just just the question, please. No speech. What is the question? What do you have to say to the trans students on this campus who feel actively victimized by your presence here? Life's tough. Get a helmet, man. I'm too pregnant for this. Next question. She's there to rile up people. And these people are, they have terrible ideas. They're terrible pol political ideas in, in general. Um, there may be some folks or some ideas that are fine um, from the folks at the Daily Wire. Some of it's going to be more reasonable and less. Re it's on a spectrum of, reason of reasonable versus just completely ludicrous um, answers. That said, she's going to a group of people. This, this is a very common tactic from the Daily Wire um, and the folks on the right. They go to colleges where they know that the overwhelming a uh, large group of the population is liberal. They're going to want to be activists. They're going to show up. They may not be yet very experienced as asking questions or pinpointing all of the details or getting. So she's been doing this a long time. She's a professional at it. She's going to be like a comedian handling a heckler. Even if the heckler has got a really good point, it doesn't really matter because she's practiced, right? This is a good response if you're the right winger or the conservative in the crowd, right? Clearly there's cheers. There is something more to be said about, hey, you show up and you say some bad stuff and then people follow what you say and go on to do bad things. There's a question about how responsible you are as a celebrity or authority figure there. I don't think the answer is you're zero responsible, but you're also not 100% responsible, right, for other people's actions. We're not going to get into that today, but it's interesting that, you know, the, she'll spend the time to pinpoint these folks as the ones she wants revenge on. Essentially, that's what she's doing, right? So she's so hurt. She's so angry from these people asking their, her questions from a job she's required to do, apparently. And now she's going to air it to essentially get revenge to make 
to target that person and say, you're dumb for asking this question and I'm smart because I'm on the daily wire and I have millions of dollars and I've very well practiced at this without having an actual conversation. I think that's the daily wire in a nutshell. My goodness. Seriously, somebody just give out free hugs or something in the, in the somebody give out free hugs. I don't I can't be your mommy. OK, I'm too pregnant. I can't be your mommy. Over and over again, I was being asked to be their mommies. They want to talk about their feelings. They don't have any facts. They just want to talk about how they feel. And they're coming to these college campuses to be coddled. So this is a whole on. feelings rift, though. Upwards to $60,000 per year to be coddled in their very. She's talking about her feelings. I mean, this is, she said it makes her angry. She doesn't want to be their mommy. She doesn't want to, like, feel this way. And she's very much vehemently going against these folks. This is a feelings-based argument. This isn't a facts-based argument. She's not presenting facts. She's just presenting people in a moment of either they didn't have a clear question, maybe they were being not so bright at the time asking in this crowd, right? Um, asking a question in, in legitimate honesty to try and get a conversation going, or maybe they were trying to you know, build themselves up to stand out against a person who they think is vile. Um, in any situation, this is this is feelings based. This isn't facts based coming from her, and that's her problem with them. Projection is one of those things. Like, go go get a therapist. You'll probably find out a lot. Various identities and the things that they want to say. Here's another example. So that girl was just victimized by my presence. How, what do I have to say? I'm victimized by you just being here, holding a mic and speaking. Well, this woman the mic you presented was much bolder her. in her assertion that she knew exactly who she was. Take a listen. As a non-binary person, what do you have to tell me about my identity? Because I know for a fact I'm not confused. Okay, next question. Great statement. That's a statement. That's a statement. Okay. You know your identity. You're not confused. Congratulations, sweetheart. Thank you very much for your statement. What was she looking for there? What did she expect me to say? Why would I care if she's so confident in exactly who she is? To be clear, if someone's non-binary, they generally go by they, them. Not always, but in particular, Candace is choosing to use different pronouns to basically do the same thing that she's been doing this entire time. Why is she snarling at me to stand up and tell me that? Go live your best life. Truly, from the bottom of my heart, I mean that. Then, of course, came a guy who asked a very long question because, like I said, they all think that they're having a brave moment that's going to circulate on the internet and they're going to be seen as a hero to the queer community. and. He even prepared a special shirt for me to wear. Yes, you're not going to see it in this clip, but underneath his sweatshirt, he did some art. and He wore a shirt that said F you, and he had one of his friends recording it because so brave to do artwork. And Candace Owens comes to speak and to hide an F you shirt underneath your sweatshirt. Take a listen to what he had to say. My question isn't specifically about anything you really said tonight, although I don't really agree with anything you said. Um, okay. I'm proudly part of the LGBTQ community. Uh, I've always stood up for my community whenever I needed to. Um, I want to focus specifically on, uh, I've been like listening to you for a little bit just to understand some things. Um, a, a live stream you did about Pride Month in June on Facebook because you were no longer allowed on YouTube. Um, the event that you were talking about, I actually had the honor of attending that event uh, with a lot of my really close friends. And I, I found it very perplexing to me how you choose to only focus on the things that are negative when it comes to the queer community. Um, Sorry, when it comes to what community? The queer community. Okay. I like, Sorry. do you not realize that people like you and people like the people you're around and that, you know, continue to have this idea of us are the reason we feel that we have to be so openly proud of who we are? Your demented homophobic and, and transphobic rhetoric and rants just further prove our point that we have to fight loudly okay. to be respected. 
the reason that LGBTQIA plus suicide rates are so high in this country isn't just because we're part of the community, it's because there are people like you who make us feel like we don't belong. The only LGBTQ agenda we have is Okay, is, it a, is there a question in there or a speech? Yes. You gotta ask a question, buddy. I how know you wrote you, out how, this out in your notes, but ask a question, let's how go. How do you and how do you think other people who, with your beliefs respond to the fact that your hateful and harmful rhetoric, rhetoric costs the lives of queer children every single day, on average, every 45 seconds. Okay, so others. this is just going to be a pure boogeyman. You're, you're pretending that someone committed suicide because of Candace Owens. You've got no facts here. You're just going, it's your rhetoric that's causing all of this. And when in reality, you want to talk about the T. Uh, I sat down with a man named Walt Heyer who was convinced to chop his penis off after your community told him that there was something wrong with him because he had confusion. Why was he trans? Because he was molested when he was four years old by his uncle. Rather than being sat down and spoken to by a psychologist, he was handed hormone pills, and he eventually chopped off his penis. Walt Heyer is now 80 years old. This was a person who was 42 years old. He said, here's one instance of detransitioning. We know that number is relatively low. Yeah, so 97% people are happy with their transition, and approximately 3% of people experience some form of regret may or may not detransition. And I remember reading this before where, you know, in that 3%, it's not all about like, oh, I, I made the wrong choice or I don't understand myself as much as like the technology wasn't where I thought it was going to be. So the end result wasn't as good as I thought it could be or hoped it would be, right? There's also like genuine pain and concern and lots of things before you go through. That's why when people go to transition, there's generally uh, psychology involved. Um, let's see. Yeah, so there's definitely in their guidelines to have conversations with therapists. We're going to put a lot of these in there, but she's saying that this doesn't happen. She's using one person's example. This is again, a 42 year old person. So an adult who decided to transition and then eight years later decided to transition back. It doesn't, I can have people trying to convince me to go and do whatever, right? At the end of the day, you know, I thought this was the party of like, I make that decision. I have the freedom to do so. I'm, I'm really concerned when I see these political ideologies flip for just one thing, right? Because when that happens, it's usually a sign that they're targeting. It's not that Candace Owens believes in every way, shape or form a person is free to make their own decisions, even decisions that end up for them being bad, right? It's that she's okay with that except for in this instance. And then we'll use that as an example to refute an entire body of evidence, studies and other people's experiences. So you have like one personal experience versus say like a hundred Where's the weight supposed to go? Well, on the side of the hundred, right? Okay. He detransitioned. He does a lot of work talking about why it is that he runs a charity, okay, an actual charity that is dedicated to sex change regret of people who have changed their parts and can't go back. And you know what happens? Suicide rates go up after they transition. After they transition. And Candace Owens wasn't the one that chopped their d off. Okay, so this study a meta study of 23 studies that met the inclusion criteria, criteria. The majority indicated a reduction in suicidality following gender affirming treatment. However, they do say um, that the literature to date suffers from a lack of methodological rigor that increases the risk of type 1 error. There is continued reason to research this stuff, of course. Yeah. So it looks like uh, Candace is referencing one study from Sweden. Uh, that even the author of the study says the claim that she's drawing is not what the study shows. That isn't to say it shows the opposite. It's to say you cannot draw the conclusion one way or the other. Um, and it would make sense that suicide rates still remain high post any kind of gender affirming care because of bullying, cultural, you know, oppression issues. Basically, all of the stuff that Candace is promoting being done. Here's a good one. So, though the benefit of the hormone treatment did not increase 
Uh, with time, the increased time since gender affirming surgery was associated with fewer mental health treatments. Still says that transgender individuals use of mental health care was still higher than the general population, even after gender affirming care, but stigma, economic inequality and victimization would do that, right? They would probably have to do some kind of like cross analysis of the general population who also has falls into those categories, which would still not be accurate, but it could give better visibility or understanding of where that comes from. So yes, there are people who regret transitioning. Yes, there are people who detransition. That percentage of people is very small, and it is not always due to the fact that they still don't feel that gender incongruity, right? The uh, the gender mismatch, right? But it is false to say that suicide rate goes up. There's only been one study that would even has been even used to make that claim. And again, the author indicated that that is not a claim you could make from the study. Okay. All of this to say, it thoroughly depresses me when I visit college campuses today, when I see the state of manhood and the state of womanhood. And I hope that you understand why. When you look at these individuals and you see what they deem to be acts of bravery and acts of glory, and you weigh it against the heroes of the past, it's depressing. I don't know what's happening with young men and young women, but I do know that we can attribute a lot of it to a crisis in parenting. That if we examined their households, the households that produce these young children, that we would get a lot of answers. You know, This is what I've been talking about over and over again. Children need to be raised by stable and strong parents who are not encouraging them to believe that everything that they do is special, that everything that they say is rational. Rather, we need parents to return to actual parenting. And that's what it feels like when I go on college campus. I feel like I am being asked to be everybody's mommy. I feel like, remember, we were looking at facts. There's a lot of presentation here that parenting has changed. Parenting has changed uh, since the early 1920s and 30s and 40s. And in general, the U.S. has become wealthier. In general, the U.S. has become less violent. Uh, there's lower violence and crimes in like the middle of the 1900s. There's a lot of things that have changed in the United States over that period of time while still increasing populations. I would need a study that would show me that there's some kind of disparity between strong parents, whatever that means, and not strong parents and people who encourage their children versus those who don't without being Pollyannish uh, about it. She's not presenting facts. And daddies, and I'm happy to do it. I have a few more stops coming up, in, one in Buffalo, one in Georgia. There will always be protesters. They exist there. In conclusion, I will restate that I don't know what is contributing to the drop in testosterone rates, but I'm observing it absolutely everywhere. And there's no doubt that in the Western world, we are facing a crisis of a shortage of masculinity. We don't need less masculinity, far be it from what the feminists have told us about toxic masculinity. We need more of it. Well, we saw in that chart of the countries that the U.S. is not alone in this drop. It's happening all over the world. Um, well, most places in the world. Uh, but we should also say that there's no connection between lowered testosterone and terrible people existing. That's not a fact-based statement. That's a feelings-based statement. So we'll disregard. And that's all I have to say about that. Okay, now it's time for some topics du jour. Topics of the day. Man, I love these transitions. So it's the say. one year anniversary since I put on the White Lives Matter shirt in Paris pa during Paris Fashion Week next to Kanye West. And when I saw these memories popping up on my phone and on my Facebook, I was like, oh, we got to talk about that because it is without question. I mean, on Facebook, the place that supposedly censors all of the right voices, right wing voices. Anyways, um, this is a celebrity stunt, right? So. And 
easily the most iconic thing that I've ever done in my career, the most viral thing I've ever done in my career, and that obviously is due to the fame level of Kanye. Well, she now he's be very by bad, brave, yeah. And reflecting right? on that time, it was just so crazy because I could have never imagined the response that we got to putting on these shirts of saying something that was so obvious and reflecting upon just that period, first and foremost, me being postpartum. Um, literally the entire time that I was on this trip, I was still breast pumping, I still dealing with all the emotions of that. And then you get a phone call from someone like Ye, and he asks you whether or not you will get on a plane overnight to come to Paris. And I kid you not, when I tell you this was a last minute trip, I mean to say that we decided to book the tickets at it's 9 nice p.m. the night before. My assistant Go woke up with a text from me, uh, which I think I sent to 11 p.m., which said stunt. you need to be on the 11 a.m. plane. Make a million so dollars. You can imagine the scramble that she had yeah. to do packing That'd to get nice. to Paris, and I had to do packing to get to Paris and to make it in time for his show, which was happening the next day. Had no idea what he had in mind. He had asked me to just be there. And then when I walked in, he held up the shirt and said, will you wear this? And there was no conversation about it. There was absolutely no conversation about it because I think. I don't have a lot of criticism on this section, like wear what you want, wear what mes political messages you think you are fine with. I don't care if people have swear words on their shirts. I really don't care about what somebody does for one of these kinds of stunts. And I think the best response to them is to just not respond to it because that's the reason why they're doing it, right? So if this just plays through the rest of the way, it'll probably be skipped because I don't want to be uh, seen as not doing my due diligence to actually have a critique uh, that is part of copyright law. So if you see me skip through the section, it isn't because it isn't there. It's just because I didn't have a lot more to comment on. We both understood that it had to be done. You know, off... I mean, it had to be done. How very brave of her. Often on this show, I talk about the natural equilibrium of the world and how I believe that when the pendulum swings one way, it will necessarily have to swing the other way. And when he held up the shirt, I understood it was one of those moments. It was one of these moments where we had to commit ourselves to swinging the pendulum. I mean, the madness that had ensued because of Black Lives Matter, the lies that were being told, people saying that this is really just about equality and we're saying black lives matter because it should and the phrase doesn't mean anything it doesn't imply that black lives matter more and so i knew the artistic and the creative direction behind what kanye wanted to do he wanted to test a theory you know if people genuinely aren't bothered and this isn't about a movement of people that are trying to make white people beneath somehow beneath black people which we that's the old 16, what, 19 kind of messaging that basically like wealthy white people convinced poor white people that they had more in common because they were both white, right? And so the black poor person was trying to take away from white folks uh, all of their land and ownership and money and stuff. And that's why they wanted to create all of these laws that differentiated whites from non-whites, um, even though everyone was getting less. Okay, That's why today it's not an argument that, oh, yes, of course, there are poor white people that exist, grew up as a poor white person. The argument isn't that. The argument is that when we look at the world of well, the United States, right, there is a long history of keeping non-whites away from wealth, generally speaking. So blacks, Hispanics make up the vast majority of those two groups. There are actual laws from the past, and there is a whole bit of slavery in the past that made these things very direct. Over time the direct channel started to go away. But if you were to have, say, 20 years ago, made a law where every single person who wears red shoes was going to go to jail for a felony, lose the right to vote, lose a lot of other rights, um, lose 20 years worth of earning income, having their entire uh, cultures and subcultures be able to 
not have access to, you know, dual parents, as she talked about family being very important before, right? When you have a system that's built like that, and then you come to find out that the only people who wear red shoes are people with blue eyes, or 90% of the people who wore red shoes had blue eyes, or that nearly 100% of blue-eyed people wear red shoes but only 20% or 30% or something like that of other colored eyes uh, wear red shoes. It would be, whether intended or not, a system that targeted and disenfranchised all blue-eyed people by virtue of a law that didn't target specifically blue-eyed people. This is where Thomas Sowell, Sowell, S-O-W-E-L-L, I think is his last name, gets a lot of things wrong with his, his books. He talks about refocusing. He does a bunch of studies about family background, all these other things that says, hey, there's no discrimination. Well, that discrimination actually comes from a history of being directly discriminatory, then indirectly discriminatory, and then maintaining the systems that have been traditionally discriminatory. And then either way, starting everyone off lower than where they were. So this is a problem, and I have a different video that I'm working on called the $900 problem. Um, if we can't solve the very basic problems, like $900 of difference between inheritances and how much of an impact that could make on somebody, uh, then we have to really look at this and go back in time and go, okay, how long do these effects actually last? How long could they last? Um, how do we correct for these? Uh, mistakes and disenfranchisement. That may be, um, we're trying to look at it racially. It could be uh, based upon gender. It could be based upon economic classes. It could be based on a mixture of all of those things. The ideal is to build a new system that doesn't discriminate at all while also providing space to kind of uplift, right? So for instance, if you had colleges be no tuition, then everyone, rich or poor people, could get into college. That wouldn't solve the problem of school districting where people who come from poor areas have to go to poor schools and poor schools are less likely to go into college, but it'd be a step in the right direction, right? Because it'd be open to everybody. Then you'd want to start fixing public schools. These are where the systemic part of the systemic racism comes in. This is where Black Lives Matter uh, comes in. Now, there's been lots of studies about what the actual death rate, how often are you know, unarmed people killed. Um, they're focused really on shootings. Uh, there's lots of problems with those reports because they're self-reported. They rely on guns. They can't be a person in custody. It doesn't include police brutality or deaths included inside of uh, police custody. Uh, Brianna's um, boyfriend who you know raised a gun in order to defend against people rushing into you know the home in which he was in um, to defend himself and his girlfriend um, at the time um, where they were both shot and killed he would not be included on that list of shot to death unarmed because he had a weapon what else counts as weapons knives combs whatnot there's a lot in there because we don't do a very good job of studying this and we don't do a very good job because the people in charge of doing the studying more often than not don't look like the people who are expressing the problem. So yeah, it does require a reminder that other folks matter. You don't really need to say white lives matter. That's all around us. It's everywhere. It's every time someone defends one of the statues of a white slave-owning racist from the South Confederate Army. It happens every single time they do a study on resumes and names that are likely to be chosen, male names over female names and white-sounding names, right? It all, all you have to do is look at the bias um, inherent in the, the population of people at the top of a company, right? People usually hire folks who look like themselves because they figure, oh, I was successful, right? It doesn't even have to have bad intentions. All of that is there, and it's too big to just be dismissed 
with a shirt that says white lives matter. It's not really factually based. It's not really testing anything. It's not art. Well, I guess it's art. It's just bad. It's silly. Like, fine, do it. Like, I don't really care. But it seems like you're missing the point if that's your argument that, oh, I can wear this and that's testing the waters. That's not a fact-based study. That's not really testing the waters. Right? We saw examples of them in the streets bowing down, shining their shoes. I mean, what took place in this country after George Floyd was sickening. It was reverse racism, or as we like to call it, racism. <laughs> it's just racism. There's no such thing as reverse racism. And as people were told that they were made to feel guilty, that they had to be guilty for being born white, that they had to account for the sins of their great, 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 great ancestors. People that had never owned slaves were now somehow being made to feel guilty about slavery by people who were never slaves. This wasn't some great reckoning that we saw with Black Lives Matter movement. Highly what was being done was the highest levels of fraud that was being committed. And my documentary that we had created uh, was meant to expose all of that. And so by putting on a simple shirt that said White Lives Matter, we were testing the theory because truly, if you believe that that's implied, the shirt wouldn't upset you. But of course it did upset people because how dare you say that? But it's not the words. Does she not understand human existence? Like this is the question, right? If you say the opposite, people will assume that you mean like, oh, white lives matter more. Like your argument was black lives matter. And you're trying to say that it says black lives matter more, right? Well, then why is it unfair for someone to assume that you're wearing this shirt and saying white lives matter more? We could say that anyone who wears one of these shirts or one of these messages is saying that whatever lives matter more than they're currently shown to matter in the culture. And then that would be true, right? Like you're trying to say that white lives matter more than they do currently in the culture because you want them to be held up more. Um, but the folks in BLM are actually saying like, we really need to value black lives more than we do today because we don't value them as much, right? Yeah. How dare you say that white lives matter? I remember the next morning um, waking up in Paris and just the phone going off like crazy. This is her normal kind of content. Headlines. And I remember and Ye strange. called me. He was staying at a different hotel. I was, than I was on a Facebook post the other day and someone was like, oh, Candace Owens, you know, she does all this fact-based stuff, lots of reports and studies. We got a couple studies in the beginning. They're easily kind of researched out and whatnot. But most of this is just all feelings, propaganda. Doesn't even have like the veil of studies or facts. I mean, that was uh, just one block up. And he said, so how are you feeling? <laughs> and I said, I don't really know what to feel processing, just the world processing this. And he said, you know, originally, I wasn't going to say anything because I wanted the shirt and the art to speak for itself. And I didn't want to answer the question, what did you mean by white lives matter? Why would you wear this shirt? What is, what is, what is, what's being implied here when you say white lives matter? But then he said, now I think it's important to answer the question. Why did you wear a shirt that said white lives matter? The answer is simple, he said, because they do. <laughs> It's just such a Kanye way of processing everything. Yeah, because they do. White lives matter as well. And that should have been abundantly clear. And it was so simple and in front of us. Anyways, it's one of the greatest memories that I have throughout my entire career. I'm grateful that Kanye included me in that show. I'm grateful for the madness that followed it. I'm grateful that we created such an iconic moment and such an iconic shirt. And I kid you not when I say that I have that exact shirt hanging up in my gym today. Uh, because it's something that obviously for the rest of my life, I will never forget. And uh, in conclusion, in case people forgot in all of the Black Lives Matter rhetoric that also, yes, White Lives Matter because they do. All right, guys, moving on. An activist poet has been randomly stabbed to death in front of his girlfriend after they attended a wedding together. His name was Ryan Carson, and he died at the age of 32 years old. It's tremendously sad. 
I want to say that off the bat, uh, but I will tell you why. My guess is that uh, since she's saying that right off the bat, um, it's going to disparage him in some way, shape, or form. Activist, poet, I can't see how she would like him or not cause him to take some of the blame of him getting stabbed. Why this particular stabbing has political significance and why people are discussing, discussing Ryan Carson's death so much today. Ryan Carson, allegedly, according to Andy No, was an Antifa member. Uh, what we can tell you for sure is that Ryan Carson, just like the young man that we showed you yesterday in Philadelphia, was without question a leftist activist. And bizarrely, uh, just like the young man from Philadelphia that we t discussed on yesterday's show, he also was an activist in terms of trying to establish safe havens for drug addicts and for homeless people. Ryan specifically hmm. wanted throughout New York City to establish safe injection sites for drug addicts. Sure. Take this a listen to Ryan to in his own words. Hello, my name is Ryan Thorson Carson, and I'm a political organizer and policy analyst from Brooklyn, New York. Like many people, my life has been shaped by the opioid epidemic that has ravaged our country. I've lost family and friends to the epidemic including my best friend to a lethal heroin overdose in 2016. My story is unfortunately common. For many, the opioid crisis hits close to home. It's time to focus on new strategies to fight back. One strategy is safe injection facilities. Mm -hmm. Not new. The facilities are a part of a I'm harm reduction that approach doing toward it. drug use. They provide sterile injection equipment, information about drugs and basic health care, treatment and rehabilitation referrals, access to medical staff, and crucially, counseling. Usually so this is weird. It's a weird thing to take up as a platform, in my opinion. We now have two young men, this young Ryan Carson and this Philadelphia man, Josh Kruger, who are really focused on making sure that drug addicts feel more at home, right? That the system is not coming after drug addicts. No, no, no. It's not so much that the system is coming at them. It's so much that giving people safe injection facilities lowers all sorts of problems costs very little compared to letting someone get sick go to an emergency room cause other problems and gives them a chance to interact with people in order to lower uh crime and those are just off the top of my head let's see oh so in another review of the studies published in august the international journal of drug policy the researchers criminologist from the university of south wales in the united kingdom found that the evidence for supervised injection is not as strong as previously thought. This was the one that the, retracted. <laughs> Mostly people are finding that if you treat drug addiction as a disease, and you want to help people, and you want to lower harm, decrease in disease, yep, also helps with health care, fewer deaths, that seems clear, reduced hospitalization. So these are kind of bucketed group, improved understanding, help addicted people recover, okay, so less dangerous waste, yep, so less likely that gets abandoned on streets and public areas, higher likelihood of treatment, which is good, decline in overall drug use, lower related crime rates, and increase in savings for emergency services and hospital visits, saves taxpayer money. Those are nine benefits. I think she's going to have a lot of feelings about drug addicts and isn't going to present a single study. Was well, a quick update to Josh Kruger. We remember he was fatally shot in his own home. Police are also investigating whether or not that was drug related. So he himself may have somehow been involved in uh, drug crimes, allegedly. We'll have to do an update on that story when the police have their conclusions. But with this guy, Ryan Carson, it is strange to me as it always is strange to me that there are people that are trying to convince you that homeless people and drug addicts are really good people, right? Despite the fact that they're on the streets and I have spoken out against this tons of times, I have been open about the fact that I have drug addicts in my own family that live on the streets. The idea that these people are just on some bad times is completely ludicrous. It is dishonest and it is a narrative that is going to get people killed, okay? It's going to get people killed. These people are desperate. They will do anything for drugs. If you gave them $2,000 a month to spend on rent, they would choose to live on the streets and spend every single penny on the next high. That Does is that the reality. Play out? 
I wonder if people have done that. Okay, so she's part of the prediction, right? So this is a research study that says, hey, we're going to give 7,500 7, Canadian dollars to these people who are homeless. We're going to follow those homeless people and then other homeless people in the area. We're going to also ask some folks, 1,100 people to predict how these recipients of the unconditional $7,500 would spend the cash. They predicted that recipients would spend 81% more on temptation goods like alcohol, drugs, or tobacco if they were homeless than if they were not. The results proved that prediction wrong. The recipients of the cash transfers did not increase pay on drugs, tobacco, and alcohol, but did increase pay on food, clothes, and rent, according to self-reports. What's more, they moved into stable housing faster and saved enough money to maintain financial security over the year of the follow-up. So this part's kind of testable. This part, who knows, right? But they didn't spend all of it on drugs and stayed homeless. They more often than not moved into stable housing faster. They saved enough money to be more financially secure. Um, and that was just, hey, here's some money. Both groups, though, did get coaching um, and life skill focused um, kind of skill training. So studies have consistently shown... Where is that from? Results show that on average, cash transfers have a significant negative effect on total expenditures on temptation goods. The negative result is supported by data from Latin America, Africa, and Asia for both conditional and unconditional cash transfer programs. A growing number of studies therefore indicate that concerns about the use of cash transfers for alcohol and tobacco are unfounded. So what she's saying is wrong and there is data to support that or studies to support that it doesn't say that a particular person you give the money may have a problem and go spend it on drugs or whatnot but definitely her example is overblown and mostly a stereotype that's wrong the majority of people that you see that are homeless on the streets and that are screaming at themselves are either high themselves, mentally unstable, or both. And so Ryan, who wanted to be a hero to drug addicts and to people that we find that are wandering the streets, who wanted to create a safe haven for those that are suffering for from them. drug addicts. He so wanted to give them up, some places for dignity and unfortunate and fate. Significance. He was to be safe. He stabbed to death by a man that I am going to assume, we won't know because he has not yet been caught was on drugs, given the fact that it was 4 a.m. and he was acting erratically on You're the streets of New assume York. Assume a person on the streets of New York. Look at this video to see what happened. Is a drug addict because it fits her narrative. Podcast, but viewer discretion advised. What we have here is Ryan and his girlfriend sitting. I am going to skip this unless there's some relevance. So I don't want to have this show up on YouTube and get paused or broken apart because of violence. So. This will likely get edited out. Sitting on a bench and they begin to walk. They were coming back from a wedding at 4 a.m. in the morning. And what takes place and what you can't see is that this man seems to be kicking something. Uh, you can hear it. And Ryan approaches him. His girlfriend stops in her tracks. And Ryan approaches him. Now, according to his friends, this is just the kind of guy that Ryan was. He thought that he could always talk to somebody. One friend shared a story about how he stopped himself from being mugged by just giving the homeless person his money. Well, this is not what happens here. You see the guy approaches Ryan. He threatens him. He tells him that he will kill him. He, Ryan then begins to defend himself and realizes, obviously, that this is serious. And then Ryan gets stabbed by this man. He is on the street, bleeding out. His girlfriend is above him. Uh, it looks like she's scared to approach him. She tells a, another young woman who appears to maybe know the person that just stabbed him to just keep the guy back. Unfortunately, she was not able to save Ryan Carson. Ryan Carson later died, okay? So he spent his last moments on this earth on that sidewalk. He spent his last moments approaching that individual, likely convinced that he could somehow do something, that he could somehow stop him, that it's just the media depiction of homelessness and crime statistics that's wrong and that you have no right to be fearful of crazy people. When you see a crazy person, you cross the street. You don't approach them. It is a known thing. Take it from me. I was born in New York. I spent seven years in New York City. That at 4 a.m. in the morning, nothing good can happen in the city. You get inside. You take an Uber. You don't take the subway. You don't approach a homeless man. You there take is an nothing Uber. 
good that happens. No, how, no matter how good and fluffy you feel on the inside, no matter how hard you want to virtue signal as a white person that you're not scared of black people even when they're behaving erratically and acting like they're on drugs and telling you that they're going to kill you. By the way, it should be obvious by now that this is why the Marine who took out that homeless person on the subway is a hero because this could have been the conclusion. He said he was going to harm people on the subway and he likely was going to harm people on that subway. Except fortunately- Fully agree that people who stop other individuals from harming even more people are heroes. But I also agree that there is a requirement from a societal standpoint to be more open than we are to folks that we assume are going to do nothing but spend their money on drugs because that's not backed by data. Both things are data backed. If you don't do something, more people get hurt. That's a fact. If you, in another situation, again, don't do something, you just leave the system as it is, more people get hurt. So safe injection facilities, good. You can't conflate these two stories um, to make him wrong because of a terrible incident about safe injection facilities. Like that, what kind of logical loops do you have to go through for that? There was a Marine there to take care of the circumstance. You don't wait to find out. You don't feel goodness in your heart and sadness for this individual. You protect yourself. That's, that is what should be abundantly obvious. Protect yourself. Now regarding his girlfriend, Claudia Morales is her name that you saw in that video, who was the last person that he saw while he was on this earth. Claudia is also an activist. She was a BLM anti-police activist, which is ironic given the fact that they are now asking the police to help them find out who killed Ryan on the streets. Claudia once posted this long message onto Facebook, which was pro-BLM, and it ended with this. The I just want to pause to read this whole thing because I'm sure by her saying ending, all we're going to get is that ending piece. So a Boston police officer very nearly ran me over last night. Okay, so this is describing a situation in which cops were speeding through areas filled with crowds and activists regularly making U-turns going down, it looks like, an alleyway. Um... stopping um not at all for them getting she even had to get pushed out of the way in order to save herself at one or to be saved at one point in time or likely would have been hit by one of the police cars so this is people being corralled um and that's just this one specific instance and then makes the claim the police do not protect you. Hope you're on the right side of history. So this would be a clearly great example of a situation in which maybe the police were being, you know, against her and the folks she was with. And that would make you feel unsafe, wouldn't it? And you would probably make a message about the police do not protect you. It doesn't also get into any other context um, Claudia has with any other situation. It's just this one post and we're going to hear from Candace which part she thinks is the most important. Important. She already mentioned the BLM part because she's really anti-BLM um, but I imagine she will knock over any of the context in this post and just sum it up. The police do not protect you. BLM. Hope you're on the right side of history. Thank you, Claudia, who was referring to protests, participating in BLM protests. She was pro defund the police. And now, of course, she and Ryan's friends are all looking to the police to try to figure out who committed this heinous act. And it was no doubt a heinous act. It's not something to applaud. It's sad. It is sad to me that people continue to delude themselves about the reality of what is happening in Democrat cities. It is sad to me that people so she's making it into a political case in Democrat cities. All these, that statistic has been kind of debunked a lot, which is that cities are do have a higher crime than rural areas. 
Um, it doesn't actually really matter who is the mayor of the city, actually. Um, and in fact, in some studies, it shows that as Democrats take over um, various cities, they do get better than they had been. But all that to say, cities tend to be a grouping of varied people. Varied people tend to start to get along or at least get more understanding of other folks and a lot of the isms go away and then people become more open to other folks. So they live in cities together and because they live in together, a lot of their biases go away or at least some of them, which makes them more liberal. It doesn't mean that cities ran by Democrats, all cities tend to be the best, safest cities the worst, most dangerous cities are more likely to be highly blue, highly Democrat versus highly Republican by virtue of the people living in them in that environment becoming more liberal and less biased. It, it's not rocket science. These people create videos trying to help drug addicts, trying to help homeless people and trying to further delude others into believing that the problem is simply racism. The problem is simply that we do not have enough compassion. This seems weird. I, I thought Candace Owens kind of represented some of the conservative marks, and a lot of the conservatives I talk to are very big on helping the homeless, helping charity. They, in fact, they want to actually take some of those support mechanisms, the social safety networks, and take them out of the hands of the government because they think that private individuals, churches, things like that will actually do a better job taking care of folks in need. And isn't that really the call to arms? Like to help other people, not dismiss them as unsavable, unhelpable. Um, I thought this is the party who valued even a fetus as a fully functioning human worthy of value and respect and care and love. And yet here she is saying, these people are bad. Don't talk to them. They're terrible. They're always going to be terrible. That's the very nature of being biased. You should not be an idiot. You should not be an idiot. Do not have so much compassion that you would put yourself into harm's way at 4 a.m. in the morning with a knife-wielding maniac. That is not compassion, that is stupidity. So, if I sound harsh, oh well, okay? That is a circumstance. If you want to stay alive, you should get a little harsher as well. Wow. The only solution to a bad guy with a knife is being bad people. Hmm. I can't do a fact-based study on that, but here's the ad, I'm cutting it out. All right, guys, now let's get into some of your comments on episodes past. These comments were pertaining to disciplining children. Only the five minutes question, left to Should go. we be spanking children? The answer definitively is, no. is that when kids were spanked, they became better adults, as That's I said not true. to you, everyone in the studio. I went. There's so many studies about this, right? Okay, is spanking bad for children? Never strike a child when you're angry. You can't even touch a child in any way when you're angry. You'd scare him, and that would be terrible. That's the quote, the father's rule of thumb for this, right? It's called Discipline. Okay, this is a not article. Yeah, so this is what's generally found to be the case. The ultimate goal of discipline is to teach a child about appropriate behavior and inappropriate behavior. Spanking teaches children that it is okay to hit others or to use physical force when you're angry hypocritical to say that a child cannot hit another child if that's what the parent does to them. Spanking is not an effective form of discipline. Spanking teaches children it's acceptable. Not surprisingly, children who have been spanked tend to be more aggressive than children who have not been spanked. Research used in MRI. Children who have been spanked have neural re brain responses to threatening stimuli, similar to children who experience more severe forms of abuse. Yeah. Plus, we don't get hit, like, in your job. You do something wrong, right? And yet you still become a better employee. What is it about a person being unable to defend themselves that makes you want to hit them instead of teaching them, coaching them? The other part of it is that when you're really thinking about spanking, right? You've lost the argument. 
you are telling a person who is five, six, seven, eight years old, nine years old, whatever the case may be, that essentially you don't have any better ideas. You don't have a good or a better explanation. You don't have data or facts to support it. You want them to obey you, not be right. Obeying comes from either respect or fear. Either one doesn't matter. Those are feelings. They're not fact-based. Candace Owens, remember, wanted these kids not to treat her like a mom. They wanted them to be more fact-based. Well, then why would she agree to be a feelings-based discipliner? Um, spanking shows all kinds of problems. It's, it's, it does the same harm as child abuse. Um, it may not be done as often, and that way it may be where there's some variance. Um, but if you spank your child, you are hitting them. There is no difference. There are plenty of other ways to discipline children. They're not incredibly bright, especially when they're very young. It's a lot easier to um, provide discipline rules, structure, boundaries in ways that are supported by facts and data and studies um, than it would be to just continue to hit kids. Sorry. I, I think in this case, Candace is not only wrong factually, but she is wrong morally. And there's something, I, there's something wrong with a person who feels like it's their need or desire or justification to be able to hit a kid. Sorry, that's my feelings towards it, but it's also backed by science. Went around and asked, everyone was spanked, except for this guy right here. I'm going to control Great, you did a survey of the people in your building. Lots bad. of people have been spanked. First comment from Tammy says, love this episode, Candice. I have been saying children need more discipline for years. I was born in South Africa, but raised in England with extremely conservative parents. Yes, they did spank on occasion. I wasn't allowed to be roaming the streets or going to parties. School and work was always a priority. Although I hated it at the time, I am 26 now and look back and I am so grateful to them. All my friends were having sex at 13, doing drugs. All of her friends were having sex at 13, doing drugs and drinking. If I were her parents, wouldn't I want to wonder why? Like all of that was okay and allowed? Maybe she should have gotten better friends? I don't know, but doing drugs and drinking in some cultures isn't even a problem at 13. So I'm not sure where that line is, but if she thinks of these things as bad, spanking isn't the solution. It's actually caring what your kids are potentially doing, maybe, I don't know. And drinking. I hope to raise my children the same way, although I worry with how the world is going that this will be difficult. It is not the norm to have traditional values and boundaries anymore. As a teacher now, I see how a lack of parenting is affecting the future generations. Yes, I can only imagine what teachers have to go through or professors have to go through when you see these Yeah, because they can't hit like kids anymore. I encountered on that college campus. Yeah, you, know, you everybody can't has whack people with they, a I don't, ruler. I don't know why they think that it's the job of their administrators and their teachers and their professors and the people that come to their college campuses uh, to speak, to deal with their feelings. They, they act very much like toddlers, except actually, no, my toddler son. Act they act like toddlers, so you should beat them. That's really the answer. You should hit them with rulers. You should spank them. Like, that's the solution. I, this, this just seems ridiculous. And now um, it's something I care a lot about because um, I don't have kids, um, but I was a child. And... Every time I was spanked, I knew that people were trying to force me into obeying a solution that they didn't even have enough facts, data, information to combat even me. So I knew I was right, but I knew for self-protection that I needed to avoid presenting that um, when they were around, but I wasn't wrong. I was correct. That's what it solidified in me. And it also solidified that I could hurt other people, uh, which when I was growing up, I did. Couldn't have beaten that out of me. 
Um, it was the kind of spanking and other instances that showed me that that was a way in which you could solve a problem. Acts way more uh, masculine than the little boys that I see on campuses. Uh, the Riza writes, the lack of discipline in many homes. These are also the arguments, by the way, um, that men in some cultures have used against women. Well, if only we could discipline them again. <laughs> it's a damn shame we can't hit them. Holmes is astounding. I had a job a few months where I was helping a family with their two and elementary level age children. To discipline their children, they used a motivation approach where every single day, both children would receive a gift from Amazon that they used to get them to do their homework or to eat dinner. It was outrageous. The children were allowed to treat me with complete disrespect and went out of their way to do something bad and then blame me for it. Sadly, the parents took the side of the children. I ended up leaving after two months. Unfortunately, they are raising monsters who are self-indulgent and will become narcissists. Yep, you are correct. The idea You're of not. giving your they child may be a spoiled, gift every um, day But rewards do, do tend to work dinner. pretty well How with psychology. The asylum? What? I'm not sure that an Amazon gift every single day is exactly what you want, but rewards of affection, care, concern. Um, it's not rocket science. It's actually similar to trying to uh, get a dog to do the right act to, to stop misbehaving. If you think that it's okay to hit your dog uh, to do that, your dog is going to become an aggressive animal. But if you treat it right and you actually do reward mechanisms, we know from psychology studies and tests that this works not just on dogs, but on people too. So it's not far-fetched. Um, and I'd rather kids be getting Amazon gifts every single day and be jealous of them than being hit every single day in hopes that they might obey some authoritarian figure. What? That is absolutely insane. Yep, they will come on. They will go on to become little narcissists that I will have to then encounter on college campuses. I am convinced of that. I will see those kids in a few years. Wife Life writes, I agree with most of what you say, but I would like to share this. I once told my son that he can't hit his brother just because he did something that he did not want him to. And he said, that's what you do. He was four years old. I quit spanking them as an experiment, and that was eight years ago. They have not had any more negative behaviors than they did while spanking. You don't have to spank them. You can punish them in other ways that don't physically hurt them. I'm not, uh, you're not disagreeing with me. I told you I don't, uh, I don't spank my kids. I put them in timeout, uh, my son at least, and it has been tremendously effective. So I have not seen a reason to spank him. When timeout, he, act, he acts like he's had acid poured on him. So you don't even follow your own advice? Like your own suggestion and comments? The timeout is not spanking. I am confused. You don't follow your own thing. You're not arguing with this person. And they are arguing with you with a counter individual point. But that actually matches up with. Studies. Okay. Him when I put him in timeout, you would you would literally think we were physically beating him. That's how much he hates timeout. So there are effective measures. I think what I have learned from other parents is that every child is different. So it works with one child, doesn't work in another. Uh, for me, I would say spankings weren't that effective. I probably think the person that I respected the most, obviously, uh, was my grandfather, and he never laid a hand on me. So, but. For other kids, people feel that they need that discipline, that they need that structure. I'm not here to judge how people are raising their kids, but I will judge you if you're not raising your kids. Wait, 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 wait. Again, So you're not here to raise, judge how people are raising their kids, but you just made fun of the narcissist Amazon people, right? You're not here to judge how people raise their kids, but you're telling them that everyone needs more discipline, otherwise they're going to be like these college kids. Um, but none of those situations you talk about, like, oh, some of those parents might be doing time out or something like you're just you were just talking about spanking and discipline and punishment in that way versus this other stuff. And now you're saying, well, I can't judge you. Have to encounter them on college campuses crying. Last comment. This person writes, there was a okay. point where spanking became ineffective, especially with my sons. I started using push ups as a discipline tool. Lactic acid built up in the muscle tissue does wonders 
for keeping attitudes in check and builds muscle and discipline at the same time. You can't beat it. I have heard about the strategy. I like it, the military strategy, making them drop down and give you 20. That feels good to me. I feel like I would be a good sergeant, and when my kids get older, I'm going to make them drop down and give me 20, even if they don't do anything bad, just because it's good. It's good for people to do push-ups. <laughs> it builds character. Outro. It's good. It is good. Simple. To the point. It's very good. Very on brand there. So if I can find that post with the Facebook person, I'm going to have to agree with them. At least in the current state, Candace doesn't really bring into bear any facts. In fact, the only data that was in this entire episode at all was that study about uh, trans individuals. Um, so she indicated incorrectly that suicide rates go up after affirming care. She also indicated that uh, there was the testosterone ones as well, right? So the testosterone ones reducing uh, testosterone in overall society, but that had nothing to do with like masculine traits, no political party, no um, basis really in any functional way. Like I couldn't see why she was bringing this up other than to make fun of people at a college campus when it would be across the population, general population decline um, due to attributes that were indicated in all of the studies um, with the exception of the one USA Today article, which indicated that there was a very, like she almost was reading it word for word. So it could have been, that was the article she was using. I can't say for sure, but any other study within just a few minutes talks about the, the cause of that. Um, why that might be a societal problem, I'm not entirely sure, though it is indicative of potentially other issues or medical concerns, stuff like that but not for the idea that on a college campus, she's feeling like she has to be someone's mommy, which was mostly what the rest of the entire episode was about. Um, there were also a lot of like conflating various problems. She doesn't understand about drug addicts or spanking. And then she also doesn't um, kind of do what she preaches. So that's Candace Owens. I'm not sure that I'll do another episode first in a while. Uh, there's at least not a lot to research. Um, from this episode. Some, but not a lot. This video is brought to you by Caffeine Zombies. Coffee's so good, it'll wake the dead.